Hello there, you Awakening Wonders. Thanks for joining me for a very special show. I'm being joined by presidential candidate, renowned environmental advocate and lawyer, founder of the Waterkeeper Alliance and Children's Health Defence, and, you know, as I've already said, 2024 Democratic presidential candidate, running on some interesting ideas. Listen to this before we meet Robert Kennedy. Listen to this. Bring the troops home, spend money on US infrastructure, heal the cultural divide rather than using the cultural war to polarize the country, dismantle surveillance, pardon Assange and Snowden, investigate and maybe even disband the CIA. And I guess we're going to have a pretty intensive reckoning over events of the last couple of years. I'm, of course, being joined by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Thanks for joining us, sir. Father's first instinct, which was a good instinct, it turns out, was that the CIA. As I was almost 10 years old, when my uncle was killed, and I was standing in the White House, in the foyer of the White House, with my aunt Jackie Kennedy, and my mother, and my father. My uncle's body was in the East Room. I, at that point, like many Americans, was asking questions, because this didn't look right. How can you speak out openly against these kind of interests, let alone try and mobilize a political movement and stand against them without serious fear of, uh, well, assassination? It wasn't just Fauci, it was the whole U.S. intelligence military apparatus that was basically Simply not possible for you to answer that question on YouTube. They were bragging that they could kill everybody, basically everybody in the world for 29 cents a, a person. What you're saying, Robert, even leaves many hardened conspiracy theorists quivering like Boy Scouts. None of this is stuff that we should be doing. Quite bloody terrifying. This is a war where Ukraine has been made a victim, not just by Russia, but by the United States government. We have to just say, wait a minute, we got to stop fighting each other. And we got to go after the people who have their jackboot on our head. It's time. Thank you for so much for having me and for all of your advocacy for the past three years. Thank which you. Which has, you know, kept me laughing and... And uh, it's, it's, it's been probably the smartest commentary on what's happening in our country of anybody else on, on, uh, on the media. So thank you, Russell. It's a great honor to have you on. The reason I want to speak to you, obviously, is because we continually critique establishment power. We continually address the anti-democratic relationships between corporations, the military industrial complex and democracy, people in Congress owning stocks and shares in, country, in companies that they're supposed to regulate, the historic corruption of American politics, the theories and conspiracy theories around the assassination of members of your own family with uh, respect for even raising it. Uh, we will discuss all of this. The first 15 minutes of this conversation will be available on YouTube. Then due to the nature of modern media to speak openly with Robert, we will only be able to bring you this conversation on Rumble. There's a link in the description. Join us there if you want to see Robert's responses to the questions I'm going to ask about the pandemic period. I'm obviously going to be speaking to him about his uh, number one best-selling book about Anthony Fauci. I'm I'm going to be talking about the assassinations of uh, John F. Kennedy and Robert F. Kennedy, once again, with respect, because it's obviously a fam family members to uh, Robert. But we'll start with this uh, simple question. Why, uh, why do you think that Joe Biden is unwilling to uh, engage in debate, even though he is not required to uh, for this part of the you know, political process? Why, why is he unwilling, Robert? I, I assume they made a calculation that the debate is not going to be helpful to the president and that he has a strong enough position now politically that he is strong enough in the polls that he can win. And, you know, the way that the setup of the Democratic Party um, in at the convention, the way the nomination happens, the uh, superdelegates are very, very influential, and he'll get 100 percent of those. So uh, I think he's confident at this point where his handlers are confident that he can win the nomination without debating me and that uh, the debate can do nothing except for put him in jeopardy. So I assume that's it, although I, I'm not really looking into, I can't really look into his head. Uh, given that you yourself are part of the most famous political dynasty in American politics, my assumption is you understand the nature of the relationships between the deep state 
and the temporal administrations that occupy power in American politics, the significant influence that donations have on policy, the insidious nature of the industry of lobbying, and of course, even the potential consequences of being outspoken. My assumption, Robert, is that you must appreciate that if you are going to stand for candidacy of the Democrat Party, that you are going to be subject to an onslaught of smears and attacks because you are uh, speaking out against the interests of, as far as I can understand, the most powerful elite uh, establishment interests that there are. How are you prepared for that? How do you uh, envisage that you will get your message across? And what kind of attacks do you, uh, uh, um, do you imagine might take place? And don't get frightened. I, you know, I'm already under a kind of an onslaught of attack, and I have been for many years. I don't mind the attacks. The censorship is frustrating because you can't really reply or respond to the attacks. Uh, but, you know, we've developed over the past three years during the pandemic a number of ways of talking to people that can end run essentially the mainstream media. So I, I'm going to take a beating in the mainstream media, but I think through podcasts like this and other ones, I think the nature of media is changing. And we've also developed a lot of techniques for working around the media. You know, even Twitter allows us to talk to a larger audience than any CNN show has. And, um, so I, you know, I, I'm gonna. It's gonna be interesting. I expect the attacks. If you ask personally how I deal with it, um, I feel like I I have to stay in kind of a spiritual place and come, and that everything I do has to come from that place. And if I do that, if I manage to to uh, to be able to stay to maintain that connection. Uh, that, you know, everything durable or enduring or important I do will come from that place and that I'm I'm kind of invulnerable there. That uh, And that the, the only thing that is going to hurt me is, is if I leave that place and start doing things that are self-interested and self-serving and et cetera. <laughs> Oh man, right, I knew it. There is a relationship between a deep spiritual connection and feeling safe in this world. Myself... Uh, if I may call you Bobby, I vacillate between service and knowing that there are greater ideals that we must appeal to, that there is real hope for the world, and then sometimes sort of collapsing like a souffle made of vanity into sort of self-centeredness and ego and my own wants. What practices do you have to sustain that? And also for you, I feel like that you must have been exposed across your lifetime through your family history, through the access that you have to the, the 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 real potency of the threat that you face i get frightened because i know like you know that if you speak out you'll be attacked by the media you who knows how far those kind of attacks could go what consequences you know sometimes that gets me and it really tests my faith it tests my spirit so i i i'm heartened to hear you say that but i but and also astonished that it is effective when you know what the consequences of speaking out against entrenched power could be? Well, you know what, I, Russell, I look back and say, I mean, I was raised in this kind of milieu where we were constantly talking about the, you know, my father was a military historian. He would come home every night and tell us about the battles that changed history. We were taught, my grandmother, my father, took us on tours, of, and my Uncle Teddy, after they died, took us on tours of all the Civil War battlefields. We grew up touring the Revolutionary War battlefields and walking the Freedom Trail in Boston and, you know, uh, memorizing poems about Paul Revere and all of the kind of, you know, her heroic uh, Victorian ballads, you know, from Rudyard Kipling and Alfred Lord Tennyson and all of those. And we recognized that there was a generation of Americans in 1776 who put their lives on the line, who put their property, who put their reputations on the line, their fortunes, uh, in order to give us the constitutional rights that we have today. <laughs> and they all said if, if the subsequent generations weren't willing to make similar sacrifices, 
that those generations would lose those constitutional rights. And I watched during the pandemic really in shock all of the Bill of Rights, with the exception of the Second Amendment, being, uh, you know, being assaulted. I saw first they came after freedom of speech and freedom of expression. They began censoring me openly and many, many other people, just doctors. I don't think we're going to be able to stay on YouTube for very much longer because I just feel that your tendency is towards <laughs> free speech and potentially antithetical to, w to the WHO guidelines. So I'm going to say, <laughs> let's move over onto Rumble now because the before and before we go, this is the question that I want you to answer. Look, my say, you've already said that you feel that the CIA murdered your uncle, John F. Kennedy. If you, uh, the, the, would some of us feel like, well, was a JFK the hero that we believe him to be in the culture? Or was he part of the system? How can anybody get into the position of the president, president without being co-opted by the very forces you describe, the, mal the malign intentions that you have outlined in your previous answer? How can you get into that position? And if indeed you maintain that, you know, your father, and of course I expect that you will claim that your father and your uncle were legitimate, virtuous, flawed, but uh, good principled men, then you must presumably believe that the, that the reason that they lost their lives is connected to those values and principles. And it's simply not possible for you to answer that question on YouTube.